it's incredibly important we accelerate the advent of sustainable energy. Uh, time really matters. Uh, this presentation is about accelerating the time to sustainable energy. Uh, the past five years were the hottest on record. We have what looks like a wall for CO2 ppm. Um, it's obviously, you know, this time is not like the past. There is a lot of good news, though. Wind and solar comprise 75% of new electricity capacity in the U.S. this year. Uh, power production from coal has dropped in half, so it went from 46% of electricity in 2010 to 23% in 2020. So in, t in terms of Tesla's contribution, we've, we've delivered over a million electric vehicles, 26 billion electric miles driven, many gigawatt hours of stationary batteries, 17 terawatt hours of solar generated. The three parts of a, a sustainable energy future are sustainable energy generation, storage, and electric vehicles. We must produce more uh, EVs that need to be affordable um, and a lot more energy storage uh, while building fa factories faster and with fa far less investment. Uh, goal number one is a terawatt hour scale battery production. We're talking about 100x growth in batteries for electric vehicles. It's a, it's a lot of batteries. And then on the grid side, uh, we, we have a similar mountain to climb. Let's say it's like roughly uh, tw 20 uh, to 25 uh, terawatt hours per year. So today's batteries can't scale fast enough. Uh, they're just too small. We would need 135 fully built out Nevada gigafactories to achieve 20 terawatt hours a year. We need a dramatic rethink of the cell manufacturing system to to scale as fast as we can and should. And then goal two, obviously, we need to make uh, more affordable cars. But in order to do that, um, we've got to get the cost of batteries down. We've got to make, uh, and we've got to be better at manufacturing. And, and we need to do something about this curve. This cur the curve of, of the cost per kilowatt hour of, of batteries is not improving fast enough. To make the best cars in the world, we design vehicles and factories from the ground up. And now we do this for batteries as well. So let's get started. We have a plan to have the cost per kilowatt hour. And we're gonna go through that plan with you today, step by step. Let's talk about what is in a battery cell. We've got the cap and the, and the can, negative and positive terminals of the cell. When you open that cell, you've got a tab connected to those terminals, what we call the jelly roll, which is the wound electrodes on the inside. To explain what's actually going on here, you've got anode, cathode, separator, positive and negative terminal, discharge the cell. Got lithium moving from anode to cathode when we charge the cell. Anode moving from uh, lithium moving from cathode to anode across the separator. This is the basic of what makes all lithium ion batteries. But when we look to the ideal cell design, if we were to do it ourselves, we found a sweet spot somewhere around 46 meters, uh, millimeters. Supercharging and thermals in general become really challenging as you make bigger cells. And this was the challenge that our team uh, set our sights on to overcome. And we did. We came up with this tabless architecture that maybe you've heard about um, that, that basically removes the thermal problem from the equation and allows us to go to the absolute lowest cost form factor um, and the simplest manufacturing process. We basically took the existing foils, laser patterned them, and enabled dozens of connections into the active material through this shingled spiral you can see. So even though the, the cell is bigger, it actually has uh, more power uh, the power to weight ratio is actually better than the smaller cell with, with, with halves. And so when we put it all together and go to our new 80 millimeter length, 4680 we call this uh, new cell design, we get five times the energy with six times the power and enable 16% range increase, just form factor alone. This is not just a concept or a rendering. We are starting to ramp up manufacturing of these cells at our pilot 10 gigawatt hour production facility just around the corner. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's a video of uh, some of what's going on in the plant. Um, now, I mean, to, to be clear, it will take about a year to reach the 10 gigawatt hour capacity. The, the actual production plants will be more on the order of uh, you know, maybe 200 gigawatt hours, maybe more over time. Let's stack up everything we just saw at the cell level. So just the cell form factor change enables a 14% dollar per kilowatt hour reduction, just that cell form factor change. And now that you've been teased on this factory, we're gonna go on and, and walk step by step through that factory. When thinking about the ideal cell factory, we have inspirations uh, behind us. Let's talk a little bit about what's in a cell factory. 
we set out at every step of this process to try to take that inspiration we just shaw showed and, and think about how we make those processes fundamentally better and more scalable. One of the most important processes is where it all begins, the wet process of the, uh, of the electrode coating. And I, just to give you all a sense of scale, I'm gonna walk through what's in that wet process. And when you're looking at this, you're like, wow, that's a lot of equipment for one step. Wouldn't it be great if we could skip that solvent step in the most basic form, you can see it here on a bench top, literally powder in, into film, as simple as that. It's insanely difficult to scale up. Um, yeah, and, but, and, and, yeah, but if you do scale it up, yeah. what, what you saw before becomes this. Yeah. So you can see the motivation. A 10 times reduction in footprint, a 10 times reduction in energy, and a massive reduction in investment. Yeah, I mean, to be clear, I would like to not say that we, right now it's just totally working. It does work, but with not a good, not a high yield. Yeah. So We're still ironing out the kinks, but we've made tens of thousands yeah. of cells, thousands of kilometers sure. of electrode. Yeah, and beyond the electrode, we, we continue to innovate on every other process step. So let's talk a little bit about uh, assembly. The key to a high-performing assembly line is accomplishing processes while in motion, continuous motion, uh, and thinking of the line as a highway, max velocity down the highway, no start yeah. and stop, no city driving. And together with our internal design team that makes this equipment and designs this equipment, we coupled thinking about how to make the best cell with thinking about how to make the best equipment so that we could accomplish the fastest parts per minute rates on all of these tools. And through all of that development, we were able to get to the point where we can implement assembly lines, one line, 20 gigawatt hours, seven times increase in output per line. And when you're thinking about scalability mm -hmm. and pure effort, having one line be seven X the capability is just effort multiplying. This is what we're trying to do here is, is say, okay, how do we, uh, with, with, a, with one factory, achieve what maybe five or even 10 factories would normally be required to achieve? Okay, now let's talk about formation. In a typical cell factory, formation represents 25% of the investment. And what is formation? It's, it's charging and discharging cells and verifying the quality of the cell. The typical formation setup is you charge and discharge each cell individually. In our car, we charge thousands of cells at once. And we took our principal and our power electronics, leveraging power wall, vehicle battery management systems, and others to dramatically improve the, the formation equipment uh, cost effectiveness and density. 86% reduction in formation investment, 75% reduction in footprint. So essentially what this translates to, based on what we know today, is about a 75% reduction uh, in the investment per kilowatt hour, uh, or gigawatt hour. It's, it's just uh, basically four times better than the current state of the art to the best of our knowledge. Uh, you can see, like, basically, we can get a terawatt hour in, le in less space than it took to make a gigawatt hour, uh, uh, you know, it, uh, 150 gigawatt hours. As I tweeted out earlier, we will continue to uh, use our cell suppliers, uh, Panasonic and uh, LG and CATL. Um, and so this is 100 gigawatt hours supplemental to uh, what we buy from suppliers. But it, but it does, allows us to make a lot more cars and a lot more stationary storage. When you look at the size of that factory on the previous page, it really shows how enabling all of these advancements are in achieving a three terawatt hour goal by 2030. And not only is all of that manufacturing innovation fantastic for enabling scale, it's also an additional 18% reduction in dollar per kilowatt hour at the battery pack level. But wait, there's more. But wait, there's more. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the anode first. Let's talk about silicon. Why is silicon awesome? It's awesome because it's the most abundant element in the Earth's crust after oxygen. Um, and it happens to store nine times more lithium than graphite, which is the typical anode material in, in lithium ion batteries today. So why isn't everybody using it? The re main reason is because the challenge with silicon is that it expands 4x when fully charged with lithium. And current approaches to solve this, which exist, I mean, we have silicon in, in the cars that you're all in right now, are involved highly engineered, expensive materials. What we're proposing is a step change in capability and a, and a step change in cost. And what that really is, is to just go to the raw metallurgical silicon itself. Don't engineer the base metal. Basically, if, if, you, if, you, if you use simple silicon, it's dramatically less than even the silicon that is currently used in the batteries that are made today. Um, and you can use a lot more of it. Um, and in the end, by leveraging this silicon to its potential, 
we can increase the range of our vehicles by an additional 20%, just this uh, improvement. Yeah, it gets cheaper and longer range. And when we take that anode cost reduction, we're looking at another 5% dollar per kilo kilowatt hour reduction at the battery pack level. And there's more. Let's talk about cathodes. What is a battery cathode? Cathodes are like bookshelves where the metal, you know, the nickel, the cobalt, the manganese, or aluminum is like the shelf, and the lithium is the book. And really, what sets apart these different metals is how many books of lithium they can fit on the shelves and how sturdy the shelves are. You, you, need, you need a stable structure uh, to contain the ions. Um, so you want a structure that does not uh, crumble or get gooey or basically that, that holds its shape in both the cathode and the anode. If it doesn't retain a structure, then you lose cycle life and your battery capacity drops very quickly. But one of the reasons why cobalt is even used at all is because it is a very stable bookshelf. And the challenge with going to pure nickel is stabilizing that bookshelf with only nickel. And that's what we've been working on with our high nickel co cathode development, which has zero cobalt in it, leveraging novel coatings and, dop novel coatings and dopants. Uh, we can get a 15% reduction in cathode dollar per kilowatt hour. In, in order to scale, uh, we really need to make sure that we're not constrained by total nickel availability. I think we need to have a, a, a kind of a three-tiered approach to, to batteries. Um, so starting with iron, that's kind of like a medium range. And then nickel manganese as sort of a medium plus uh, intermediate. Um, and then a high nickel for long range applications like Cybertruck and uh, the semi. Beyond the metals, because a lot of people spend time talking about the metals, actually the cathode process itself is a big target. 35% of the cathode dollar per kilowatt hour is just in mo transferring it into its final form. Here's a view of the traditional cathode process. Uh, and so we've, we've looked at the entire value chain and said, how can we make this as simple as possible? And that's what we're proposing here with our process. As you can see, a whole, less, a whole lot less is going on here. We get rid of the intermediate, metal water, final pro product cathode, recirculate the water, no waste water at all. And when you summarize all of that, it's the 66% reduction in CapEx investment, a 76 reduction in process cost, and zero waste water. And then when you think about the fact that now we're actually just directly consuming the raw metal nickel powder, it dramatically simplifies the metal refining part of the whole process. So we can eliminate billions in battery grade nickel intermediate production. It's not needed at all. Now that we have this process, obviously we're gonna go and start building our own cathode facility in North America and leveraging all of the North American resources that exist for nickel and lithium. And just doing that, just localizing our cathode supply chain and production, we can reduce miles traveled by all the materials that end up in the cathode by 80%, which is huge for cost. And on that note, the way the lithium ends up in the cell is through the cathode, so then we should obviously on-site lithium conversion as well, which is what we will do using a new process that we're gonna pioneer. That's a sulfate-free process again, skip the intermediate. 33% um, reduction in lithium cost, 100% electric facility co-located with the cathode plant. So it, it's important to note that there is a massive amount of lithium on Earth. We found that uh, we can actually use table salt, uh, sodium chloride, uh, to uh, basically ex extract the lithium from the ore. <laughs> we actually got uh, rights to a, a lithium clay deposit in Nevada. Over um, 10,000 acres. And, and there really is enough lithium in Nevada alone to electrify the entire U.S. fleet. Just what's in Nevada. That's, uh, that's basically so much damn lithium on Earth, it's crazy. <laughs> and eventually, as we said at the beginning, when we get to this steady state 20 terawatt hours per year of production, we will tr transfer the entire non-renewable fleet of both power plants, home heating and, 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 batter and, and industry heating, and, and vehicles to electric. And at that point, we have an awesome resource in those batteries to recycle to make new batteries. We are starting our pilot full-scale recycling production uh, at Gigafactory Reno next quarter to, to continue to develop this process. Long term. New batteries will come from old batteries uh, once the fleet reaches steady state. So we just talked about scaling cathode and recycling. All of the benefits that you just saw are added to this benefit of a 12% reduction in dollars per kilowatt hour at the battery pack level. Almost at our have the cost goal, but there's one more section. Take it away, Elon. Oh, so um, I mean, there's an architecture that um, we've been wanting to do with Tesla for a long time, uh, and we're finally 
we finally figured it out. It starts with uh, having a single piece casting or a single piece casting for the front body and the rear body. Um, and uh, in order to do this, we uh, commissioned the, the largest casting machine that has ever been made. And it's currently working just uh, over the road at our uh, Fremont plant. In order to do this, we actually uh, had to develop our own alloy uh, because we wanted a high strength casting alloy that not, did not require coatings or heat treatment. Uh, this is a big deal for, for castings, especially with a, la a large casting. If you heat treat it afterwards, it, it tends to deform. It kind of like does this like potato chip thing. So it's very hard to keep a large casting uh, to have its shape. Um, so in order to achieve this, th there was no alloy that existed that could do this. So we developed our own alloy, a special alloy of aluminum that has high strength without heat treat and, and is very castable. That then inter the interfaces to uh, what we call it the structural battery, where the battery for the first time will have dual use. Uh, the battery will both have the use as an energy device and as structure. This, this is absolutely the way things are done. In, in the early days of, of aircraft, they would carry the fuel tanks as cargo. Then somebody said, hey, what if we just make the wing tanks, what, what if we just make the fuel tank in wing shape? And then the, the, the fuel tank serves as dual structure. Um, and it's, not, it's no longer cargo. It's, it's fundamental to the structure of the aircraft. We're doing the same for cars. So instead of having these like uh, supports and stabilizers and stringers and structural elements in the battery, we now have a lot more space in the battery because the pack itself is structural. So the, the volumetric efficiency of the structural pack is, is much better than a non-structural pack. And we actually bring the cells closer to the center. Because they're closer to the center, the, uh, it reduces the probability of, uh, of a side impact uh, potentially contacting the cells. It also proves uh, what's called the polar moment of inertia. And that means you can you, the car maneuvers better. It just feels better. So 10% mass reduction in, in the body of the car 14% range increase, uh, 370 fewer parts. In the factory, it's a massive simplification. You saw the part removal. Um, you know, it's casting machines. It's the structural battery pack. So we're looking at over 50% reduction in investment per gigawatt hour, 35% reduction in floor space. And we'll continue to improve that as we make the vehicle factory of the future. And in addition to the improvements we just said on enabling additional range and improving the structural performance of the vehicle, it is worth another 7% dollar per kilowatt hour reduction at the battery pack level, bringing our total reductions now to 56% dollars per kilowatt hour. Yeah. We're not just talking about cost or range. We've got to look at all the facets. So range increase, we're unlocking up to 54% increase in range for our vehicles and energy density for our energy products. Uh, 56% reduction in dollars per kilowatt hour at the battery pack level, and a 69% reduction in investment per gigawatt hour. Now, to be clear, it will take us probably a year to 18 months to start realizing these uh, these advantages, and probably to fully realize the advantages, probably it's about three years or thereabouts. So long term, we want to try to make about 20 million vehicles a year. What does this mean for our future products? Uh, so uh, we, you know, we're confident that long term we can design and, and manufacture a, a, a compelling $25,000 electric vehicle. I think probably, uh, w w like I said, about, about three years from now, uh, we're confident we can make a very, com a, a very compelling $25,000 electric vehicle uh, that's also fully autonomous. Um, and uh, we should probably talk about uh, the you know, Model S Plaid. You know, what about that? <laughs>
So uh, thanks again. Uh, super appreciated. Um, and look forward to the next event. Thank you. Thank you.